So here's another coin tossing game that's a little bit more complicated than the previous one, and as we'll see, has some really interesting properties. So this game is known sometimes as the St. Petersburg game. And I believe the reason for this is that um, one of the Bernoulli brothers, I think Daniel, who lived or used to live, lived for a while in St. Petersburg, um, did some work on the mathematics of what I'm about to describe. So here's how this game is played. You toss the coin until you get a heads, until it comes up heads. So that could take one toss, it could take a bunch of tosses. It's sort of like me throwing the um, paper in the uh, recycling bin. You do it until you get a success. Here you do it until you get an H. And then the amount of money you win is two to the X, where X was the number of tosses. So I think the easiest way to um, illustrate this is to just play a couple of rounds. So let's do trial one. So this could be an adventure. I'm going to have to toss this coin a lot. Here we go. All right, so that was tails. And I'm not over yet. I'm still playing the first game, the first trial. Do it again. And that was a heads. So T, H. So I had to toss twice. So this is um, two. Two to the two, two squared is four. My total winnings are four and my average is four. Okay, now let's play again. So I toss the coin and I get a tails. And I toss again. And I get another tails. And I toss again. Let's see? And that was a head. So, tails, tails, heads. That's three times. Two to the three is eight. My total winning now is eight plus four, which is 12. To get the average, I won $12 in two games, so my average winning was six per game. Let's do one or two more uh, trials, one or two more games. So I'll toss, and that was an H. So this is trial three. I get an H right away. Game is over. So now I did just one toss. Two to the one is two. The total winnings now is 12 plus the two that I just won, that's 14. And the average is gonna be 14 divided by three, which is, let's see if I can do that, four, six, seven. Yep, okay, so. The question now is, what are the average winnings for the St. Petersburg game? As I play this again and again, three times, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, what does this average get closer and closer to? For the uh, simple coin toss game, we could see right away it was going to a half. Here it's not so clear. Most of the time we'll win $2 or $4, occasionally eight. But every now and again, there will be a, um, a really big payoff. Maybe you happen to get lucky and toss seven tails and then get a head, so the payback would be two to the eight, which is a really big number. So how do all these numbers sort of sift out in the long run? How do they average? So we'll start, like we did before, with an experimental approach. So I again wrote a computer program to simulate the St. Petersburg game. And here's what happens to the average for uh, 100 times. So the average looks like I won four the first time, and then it drops down, then it had a big payoff and the average spikes, and then it drops down. A few more big payoffs. And, um, right, so the big payoffs are these big spikes upward. We get a big dramatic event, a really big payoff. Maybe I got a payback of 128 here, so the average shoots way up. And then um, 
we don't get a big payoff for a while, and so the average uh, is going down. And we wonder, all right, well, what is the average winnings going to? We've done it 100 times. That's a fair amount. Kind of looks like it's going to 15, maybe 14. Maybe it's going to slide down to 12. Let's see. So now let's look at this plot. Instead of going from 0 to 100, we'll go from 0 or 1 to 1,000. So let's see what that looks like. So before, we were just kind of got up to here and was saying, all right, maybe it looks like it's going to 15 or 14 or 12. Well, it slides all the way down to 10, but then something really dramatic happens here a little after 300 and big payoff, and it spikes way up, all the way up to 40. So that must have been a really big, a big win. But then again, it's sliding down, occasional jumps up, but we see this sort of Typical behavior sliding down. Again, we wonder, what is it going to? Maybe it's approaching 20, 21. Maybe it's going to go to 24. Who knows? Let's see. We can keep playing or have the computer keep playing. And now, if instead of doing 1,000, we'll do uh, 10,000. So this was that big spike up to 40 that we saw before. And we don't see... Um, Another really big spike, although we see one here at about 21, 2200, slides down with occasional bumps, then a, then a bump up, another bump here. Again, we're wondering what is this going to? Maybe it's going to six, you know, 16, we might be suspicious. That's a power of two. You know, who knows? All right, let's keep playing. We evidently haven't reached the average behavior yet. Contrast that with the situation for the coin toss where we can see this is really approaching a straight line. The wiggles get really quite small. And same scale, 10,000 of the basic coin game, pretty boring, right? 4,000 to 10,000 look almost uh, microscopic fluctuations. Not so here. We're still seeing some bumps and some wiggles in this curve. So let's keep going. What if we go out to 100,000? Now that big peak at 40 is way off on the left, and we see um, here's 10,000. This is what we're looking at before. Again, it's still not settling down. It peaks up to above 20 a couple times, but now from 40,000 to 100,000, it looks like it's finally reaching its average. It's approaching some steady value. Maybe it's around 16, as we had suspected. So let's, just to be sure, do uh, one more continued experiment another step farther. Now I'm going to go out to a million. So what happens if we play this game a million times? That surely should be enough to get a good average. And it kind of looks like that's the case, but it's drifting up. And then something remarkable happens around 850,000. There's some huge payoff that drives the average way, way up to 60, and then it wiggles down. So at this point, we might be wondering, well, what's going on? How far do I have to go in order to get a good um, sense of the average winnings from the St. Petersburg game? But then we wonder, maybe this isn't even a, a sensible question. Maybe the average winnings don't exist at all. So let's turn away from the computer and go back to pencil and paper, or Sharpie and paper, and see what we can learn about the average. And what I'm going to do is similar to what we did for the basic coin toss game. To figure out the average, I said, all right, well, there are two things that can happen. There are two possible outcomes. And what are the probabilities of those outcomes? <clears throat> Multiply those by the winnings from those outcomes, and we get the average. So I'm going to do the same thing for the St. Petersburg game, but it's going to be a little bit more complicated because, as we've seen, there are lots of different outcomes. You can get H, TH, TTH, TTTH, and so on. So let's write that out. So here I've started listing out the different things that could happen. You could get an H, TH. TTH, TTTH, and so on. 
That's what this dot, dot, dot means. If you get H, you get 2 to the 1, or just $2. If you get TH, you get 2 to the 2. Why 2 to the 2? Because, it, <clears throat> because there were two tosses here, and you're always winning 2 to the number raised to a number where that number is the number of tosses. Here there are three tosses, it's 2 to the 3, and so on. Okay, so now we need to think about PR of H, probability of H, probability of TH, and so on. So let's see. Probability of H, <clears throat> again we'll assume this is a fair coin, that's a half. Half the time you'll get an H right away. Probability of TH. So that's equal to the probability of T times a probability of H. We're assuming these coin tosses are independent. And so the probability of tails is a half. The probability of heads is a half. So that's a half times a half, which is a half squared. TTH, well, that's the probability of T times a probability of T times a probability of H. All of those probabilities are a half. It's a fair coin. So the prob probability of TTH is a half cubed. Times 2 cubed. TTTH, half times a half times a half times a half. Oops. That's a half. Sorry about this. So, uh, the terms keep on going, but we can learn something about what happens by just looking at these. So what's going on? Well, 2 times a half is 1. 2 squared divided by 2 squared, well, that's 1. 2 cubed divided by 2 cubed, that's 1. 2 to the 4th divided by 2 to the 4th. So the sum is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 keeps on going. So this is tending towards infinity. So we would say that the average is infinite, or equivalently, that the average does not exist. So the St. Petersburg game does not have um, an average winnings, does not have an average outcome. So this is pretty weird and maybe a little bit unsettling. How can it be that this fairly simple process doesn't have a meaningful average? Well, um, we've seen it mathematically here, so hopefully that's believable. But another way to think about this is as follows. What's happening is, is right, when we form an average, we add together a lot of numbers. And then we divide by the number of numbers we just added up. For the St. Petersburg game, um, there are occasionally very, very, very large numbers. And those numbers are rare, so we don't see them that often. But when we do see them, they can be enormous, astronomical, enough that they pull the average way up. And as we've seen, that's going to keep happening. So if I had this computer program go out to 10 million, 100 million, a billion, and so on, this behavior still wouldn't settle down. So what this means is, is that averages, which is a property that we think of as natural and normal, um, maybe we shouldn't take for granted. Most things in life have averages, but not everything has to have an average. So the outcome of a game like this um, again, doesn't meaningfully have a mathematical average. There's one more point that I want to make about averages. So in a typical situation in science, we might gather some data and report an average. Maybe we go out and measure the height of a bunch of trees, 10 or 50 trees, say. And when we report that average, typically we do it in a way 
that implies that that's a statement about more than just those 50 trees. After all, who, why would you care about my 50 trees? But you might care about trees in general, of particular species, or how they grow under certain conditions. So the point is, when we describe something with an average, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, we're using that to make a general statement, say, about all trees, not just those particular 50 trees. But for something like the St. Petersburg game, we get in trouble if we try to do that. Um, sure, I can play the game a hundred times and report the average. That's a well understood, that's a well defined mathematical sort of thing. What's not the case is that that necessarily gives any uh, information about the St. Petersburg game in general. Right, so for the trees, if I report an average height of 20 meters, average heights of trees exist, presumably. And so what that's saying is, okay, the average height might not be exactly 20 meters, but I know it's close to 20 meters. And that would hold true. I'd get a more and more exact result as I got more and more data. So those first 50 trees or first 100 trees are telling us something in general about trees. But that's not the case here. The average, as we've seen, is infinite. And so reporting a finite average doesn't really capture that fact. So here's another slightly different way of th thinking of the same thing. When an average exists, the more data you get, the better your estimate is for an average. When, it, when an average doesn't exist like this, in a certain sense, it's almost like the more data you get, the more misleading it is. Just when you think things have settled down, you get this big spike again. So again, I guess the moral of the story is, is that we shouldn't take averages for granted. Almost everything has an average, but not everything does. And in those situations, reporting the average from a finite small set of data can be very misleading.